We're filming this today from my clinic in Stratford-upon-Avon. So I've got with me Rebecca Lewis, who is a director here with me, who's also a GP with a special interest in the menopause. So thank you for joining us, those of you who are uh, live tonight. Um, and we were going to record it, so it will be available at other times as well. So for those of you who are on our waiting list, we're sorry that we can't get through you all. And we've had a massive expansion in the clinic. But for us, it's really important that women are given the right information, the right treatment by doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals who really are very well trained. And very frustratingly, too few people are trained in the menopause. So all the, the healthcare professionals that are working with us have been trained to a high standard. So we are um, recruiting more people. We've got lots more doctors, nurses and pharmacists actually coming to join us soon. So the waiting list will improve. So we wanted really just to share a bit of us with you tonight, but also to just to talk through. Some of this you might know already, some of it you might be pleased to hear again, and hopefully there'll be some new information as well. You'll see we, we, we're not selling anything here. We just have um, different types of HRT that we will talk through later. So we thought initially we would just talk about the menopause, the perimenopause, what it is, um, what the symptoms can be, and also the health risks as well, which some of you might not be aware of. Then we'll talk about um, treatments that are available. And then finally, we will talk about ways that you can help either before you come to the clinic or if you're never coming to the clinic, that's fine as well, but ways that you can empower yourself to get the right help, support and treatment. So Rebecca, we'll start off and I'm gonna just, we're gonna do it as a question and answer, so to try and make it a bit less formal. So let's just think first off, what is the menopause and what is the perimenopause? Yeah, I know, it's, it's important to get definitions right, isn't it? So the menopause is actually a year and one day after your last period. So you only know that once it's happened, so it's a look back in time diagnosis, mm -hmm. isn't it? And the perimenopause is the time leading up to that, to that last period. And that can precede the menopause for about 10 years, really. So this is when the ovary begins to fail. Um, and stop producing eggs reliably. We, we run out of eggs, which is normal and natural, um, but when the ovary starts to fail, the production of hormones is intermittent and fluctuates and can give a, women a lot of symptoms, often quite uh, dramatic in the perimenopause. Um, and this is the time when it can be difficult for women to understand what's going on because they're probably still having their periods or they may have changed a small amount, um, got a bit longer, further apart or a bit closer together. The period has actually got heavier or lighter, um, but they're beginning to develop symptoms. And of course, the symptoms can be quite strong on one mm. month and then disappear uh, the next. So we, you know, hear constantly in the clinic that, that people sort of normalise their symptoms. So they attribute their, their work-life balance, their stress at work, difficulties with the children, elderly rev relatives perhaps. It's a, it's a stretch time for women generally. So this is why it can be difficult to, to know what's going on and, um, and actually their symptoms are probably due to their uh, fluctuating hormones rather than lifestyle. Because hormones are so important, aren't they, throughout mm. our whole body. Mm. And a lot of people think, well, hormones are just about our periods. And when our periods stop, well, that's it, end of. And it's mm. not as easy as that. And there isn't one cell in our body that doesn't respond to the hormone estrogen is there. And when you think about that, then it makes you realise that every single system in our body can be affected by our low mm. hormone levels. And mm. that's what the menopause is. It's a low hormone. It's a hormone deficiency, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, mm. And so a lot of people think you go through the menopause because symptoms might improve or stop or change. But the low hormones always occur, don't they? And that's yeah. what happens, isn't it, with the menopause because our ovaries stop producing eggs. Um, this is it. You're never going to get your hormones back. No. And, and a lot of people, it happens naturally, doesn't it? Our hormones mm -hmm. just run out because our egg production mm -hmm. reduces and our eggs stop being produced, so therefore the hormones decline. But yeah. there are other reasons, aren't there, why people can be menopausal? Yeah, exactly. So the average age of menopause here in the UK is about 51, but the age range is 45 to 55. Earlier than 45 is called an early menopause, mm. but one in a hundred people will be under the age of 40 when they reach their menopause, which is not rare, and one in a thousand will be under 30. Uh, reaching menopause naturally, 
And, and then, of course, we have to think about menopause because of treatments, um, often cancer treatments. The drugs themselves, the chemotherapy can affect the, the, the ovary and render women uh, without, without hormones. Or surgical, they may have been removed um, deliberately for a treatment um, mm. process. So women can be plunged into the menopause at all stages of life, really. It's important to know that. Yeah, and like you say, the perimenopause, mm. and that's the time around before the actual period stop, the menopause can occur for a decade before. So if one mm. in a hundred women are having it under the age of 40, yeah. that means there's a lot of women in their 30s and 20s who are perimenopausal and don't know. Absolutely. Because there's not a blood test, is there, to diagnose? How do we explain? No, how it's, do we it's, diagnose? it's very difficult. Um, there is no reliable blood test no. to diagnose this. So it's a clinical diagnosis yeah. in the main. Um, uh, you know, on women's symptoms. We, we, we have a whole set of uh, Eastern deficiency symptoms um, mm -hmm. that we can go through, and everyone knows about hot flushes and night sweats. But actually, as Louise was saying earlier, the importance of the hormone all around our body, I mean, I, I, you know, never ceases to amaze me how many symptoms a lack yes. of estrogen can cause. And there are so many different websites, aren't there? And some of them will say there's 72 symptoms, 96, yes. there's some. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah. I, there's always a discussion of how many. Well, actually, I don't think there is a maximum number, isn't there? Because we constantly hear different symptoms. Yeah. And, and even the hot flushes and sweats, they're not mm. even hot flushes sometimes. Some people become mm. very cold, don't they? Yes, and exactly. It's the, their temperature regulation yes. has gone haywire. Yeah. Mm. So, and if you work through the whole body, you know, our brain mm. is really important. So people get headaches, dizziness, they can get brain fog, memory problems, concentration problems, yep. eyes can get dry eyes, um, even dry mouth. Um, mouth. Yeah, yeah, that's quite common actually. Ears can be affected, can't they? Yeah. Tinnitus is, is, a, is a common, common yes. symptom actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our hearts are affected, yeah. our lungs even can be affected, some people have breathing problems, don't they? Yep. And, um, or yeah. asthma can worsen. It's um, and then even the bowel. A lot of people have um, gastritis or irritable bowel Yeah, syndrome. I've had a lot of people with nausea actually yes. come to me, which was, uh, you know, quite a new symptom. I haven't yeah. encountered that, no. that commonly, but um, it is quite common. And then if we think about our, our arms, then our muscle can, can be painful, sore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, people can have joint stiffness, inflammation. Often people find in the morning just getting out of bed. Lots yes. of women say, I feel like an old lady. I can't get down the stairs. <laughs> And, yeah, um, and this is because oestrogen is an anti-inflammatory, isn't it, in our muscles and our joints. And mm -hmm. um, and then if you work further down, obviously it can affect the vagina. We've already said vaginal dryness is a is mm -hmm. a symptom which mm -hmm. is very common. And and I think vaginal dryness is such a wrong it's word. Such don't an you? awful it's word. Dreadful. It's so terrible. It, it, it makes it sound oh, a bit dry. Put a bit of moisturiser, it'd be yeah. fine. And Absolutely. it's so devastating. It it, yeah. Really. And it's wrong. Actually, a lot of people don't have dry vagina. No. They, they sometimes have increased secretions they do, or yeah. they have discomfort yeah. or pain. Yeah. And yeah. so it's any sort of difference in mm. feeling, really, mm. isn't it? Mm. Um, but because we've got oestrogen receptors, on our vaginas but also in our bladders and our urethras, mm. Mm. people can have urinary symptoms as well, can't they? Yes, and often investigated, have cystoscopies and investigations yes. to the perhaps they may have had recurrent urine infections. Yes, which is very common, isn't mm. it? And again, mm. don't think about how important oestrogen is. Um, yeah. And um, so really everywhere can be affected and it don't, people don't get all the symptoms. Um, some people don't get any symptoms, some people get yeah. some symptoms and then they change with time and so it can be very difficult and the, the big sort of barometer if you like is periods isn't it? So if yes. the periods are changing or altered or certainly if they've stopped and you have symptoms you have to think about the perimenopause or menopause but a lot of women um, might have had a hysterectomy and removal of the womb, or a lot of women also have a marina coil, yeah. sometimes for contraceptive purposes, and then they won't have periods. Mm. So then how do we diagnose? That's quite hard, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I always advocate the use of um, uh, a qu menopause questionnaire, yes. form, um, which lists all these <laughs> symptoms we've just listed, um, and, and you can see at a quick glance. Yes, you've got one. I've here. got one here. I'll show you. Yes, show. Sure. So, so there we are. It looks see see, and there are more symptoms than that. But these are a list of all the symptoms we've just discussed. So this is one we use in the clinic. It's modified yeah. um, from one that's used a lot in research, and mm. you can grade your symptoms. And it can be downloaded from my website, menopause doctor. Um, .co.uk and it also the free app that we've got Balance 
you can download mm. and that's really useful actually and I really feel that women who are really young should start it. I mean, mm. I wish I'd started doing one of these 10 years ago. Tracking it really. And then mm. every, um, like four times a year, every three months, you just do it again. And if you're finding your symptoms are changing, think about your periods if you're having them. And if they've changed too, they don't always have to change um, in frequency, but just their nature. Some people say, oh, they've got a bit lighter or, or even a bit heavier. Yeah, it's, it could be really and, subtle, can't yeah, it? I mean, it's often it could be someone who had a 28 day cycle and mm. suddenly it's, it, then it becomes 26 and the, and the periods are a bit lighter for example yes and so it's subtle the yeah. change in periods and really. so again it's important to track and monitor your mm. periods and so even with the app the balance app you can do it that way as well mm. um because it, it's it you know everyone's busy i never used to monitor my periods at all and i wish i had because i would have realized what was going yes. on when i started to have migraines and forgetfulness and um, irritability so um, but this is a really great way isn't it and certainly um, for lots of women just making the diagnosis themselves is really important because yeah. it can be really scary actually when very frightening symptoms. well you mentioned the brain fog and the, mm. and the loss of concentration struggling at work yeah. and people are really really worried that they're getting dementia yes. they may have it in the family it's on their mind and they and they and just me saying that to them it's not dementia it's your hormones it's is a great a relief I don't it's say anything else when they're just yeah. pleased to to know that information yeah. one of my patients recently told me she'd given up work and she worked yeah. as an, an administrator she worked yeah. in a big company she worked there for 25 years and she said in the morning she'd get to work she couldn't remember her password and we all have times when we can't remember our password but she said every morning she'd look at the screen mm. and think, my goodness, I can't remember it. And she'd hear the younger girls behind her almost laughing and she just oh, lost terrible. her confidence mm. completely. Um, and anxiety is a really common symptom, isn't it? I don't know anyone who hasn't had a degree no. of anxiety no. and gone through the menopause. I mean, it varies, yeah. obviously, but it can be, dis I mean, paralysing, I'd yeah. say. Absolutely. Women have become yeah. housebound, certainly aren't able to work. Yeah. Not driving, that's a common symptom, actually. They, they, really People common. suddenly decide, you know, they're so anxious, they, they can't drive on no. motorways or at night, yeah. and they're not at all. It's yeah. a really common symptom. It is, and I hadn't realised quite how common it was, but no. just because we see so many women, but yeah. also... People um, say they don't go on public transport. No. Um, in, this is pre-COVID times. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. they're too scared to to, yeah. to go on. Someone said to me the other day she'd stop driving because she couldn't use a sat nav because her brain couldn't drive and, and follow directions. Yeah. There were two things yeah. going on. She too much multitasking. Um, yeah. So it's. Um, and women don't always realise, and if you don't talk to other women, you don't realise other women are suffering the same either, do you? It's well, no, well, if you don't know it's the menopause, yeah. you, you're probably down having, having head scans and seeing yes. a neurologist and worrying yeah. about early dementia. Yeah. So you, you haven't got a common sort of ground to talk with your friends no. necessarily that it is. And you might be a little bit ashamed or worried about it for some reason, which is, is crazy, but yeah. it, it, it's, it's so wrong. Um, you know, when we are feeling anxious, that we, we try and hide it. And we need to, need to discuss this and, and understand why. Definitely. And I think some people are scared of talking about it because they think it's, it's ageing. And of course, it is something that happens when we get older. Mm. But actually, because young women are affected as well. And mm. I was saying to you earlier, I spoke to a lady today who's 27 and was brought into the menopause because she had got yeah. breast cancer and the treatment had made her have an early menopause. And mm. she was really struggling and she mm. said, the clinic they said to her well it's just a symptom it's just a side effect of treatment mm. and they sort of trivialized it mm. so now she's finding it really hard to sit down because she has such bad vaginal dryness but mm. she doesn't know who to talk to about it. It. she's had urinary tract infections no mm. one's spoken to her about that and mm. she's really alone actually very isolating and it frightening. is frightening mm. yeah when she's got enough to contend with the mm. diagnosis totally. as well totally mm. so Definitely. all ages we need to be talking about it and break this taboo so so, um, but as doctors, obviously we, we worry about women and patients who have symptoms, but mm. also we really look at people's future health as well, don't we? Because mm. as much as we doctors, we want to keep people away from us. Yes. And, um, you know, the NHS in the UK is, is overwhelmed, but even other health care systems in other countries mm. um, only have so much money to spend. And certainly since we trained in the 80s, there's been a big shift, hasn't there, between um, now people with obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's. Mm. The rates of these diseases is really gone, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And most people now, um, women, will die from Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease, won't they? It's the number one. 
uh, yeah. cause of death. Yeah. Yes, and mm. that's partly we're living longer, aren't we? Mm. So if we had this conversation a hundred years ago, um, death would be quite different because we would die in our fifties, which is quite soon after most women have their natural menopause, as you say. Yeah. But actually, now the average life expectancy is so much more, isn't it? In the UK, it's eighty-two. Yes, it's, um, exactly. So that's a good thirty years on average. Yes. You'll be postmenopausal. Yes. So that means a third of our lives or so without hormones. Yes. Um, and so whether women have symptoms or not, there are health risks, aren't they, of not having these hormones, which. Um, for some of you that know me know I go on a lot about them because I think it's so important that we know mm. because it didn't matter in the Victorian times about these health risks because we died quite soon after. Exactly. But they're, they're real and, and mm. they are directly related to low oestrogen levels, aren't they? So, mm. Mm. so it just talks yeah, so, about so, I mean, as you say, in the Victorian times, the average age of death was 59. Yeah. So we are now knowing more about mm. the health risks because we're living longer. We can see the devastating effect of living without oestrogen mm. on our cardiovascular system. Um, and the, the risk of, of heart disease increases enormously when a woman goes through the menopause. Um, and often it's undiagnosed because uh, women can present slightly different uh, types of, of symptoms compared with men. So they often do worse when they do have a heart attack. Mm. Um, osteoporosis is one in two women over 50 will suffer with osteoporosis. I mean, that's a shocking, yeah. shocking statistic. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, that's due to lack of oestrogen as well. Um, young women, especially if they have a long time without oestrogen, it's very clear that they have a higher risk of, of all, of many diseases, including cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, dementia, type two diabetes, um, obesity, and even other sort of illnesses like asthma and mm. um, uh, depression um, so it, it just shows how important yes. um, having our hormones are for our future health yeah for the function really. it is and mm. and younger women who have an early menopause it's even mm. more important because they have longer without their hormones don't potentially they? So, exactly so um, these risks are really real and mm. they're there mm. and you know, when, when you say to women, I spoke to a woman this morning, she said, oh, I'm through the menopause. Well, mm. firstly, you're never through it. Even if you're okay. through the symptoms, you've still got low hormone levels. But mm. you're five times more likely to have a heart attack after the menopause. Yes. Uh, because oestrogen is a great anti-inflammatory. It reduces any low-grade inflammation mm. in the body. And low-grade inflammation is not good because it increases like you say, the risk of heart disease, yeah. obesity, diabetes, but also some types of cancer. So, mm. for example, bowel cancer is thought to be a higher risk mm. um, when we we're older as well. But other cancers we're, are more common as people age. And some yeah. of this is probably related to this sort of chronic inflammation that goes on when we haven't got oestrogen in mm. our bodies. Mm. Um, so it's quite... Um, it's more to it than just having oestrogen to um, stop your symptoms, really, isn't it? So much more, yes. I mean, it's really for the f future. Your future health, I think, is, is so important mm. to be thinking about. After all, we're thinking about it in our diet, perhaps, or looking at exercise and, and what have you, which is all very important. Yeah. But actually, the, the, the linchpin is getting your hormones balanced and, and yeah. right first, I think. So that comes under treatment, doesn't it? Mm. So mm. when we um, look at what we're doing with our treatment for, for menopausal women, we've made the diagnosis, or hopefully a woman's made the diagnosis herself, then what can she do about it? And the most important thing is to have evidence-based treatment, because if you Google menopause treatment, there'll be so much that mm. will come up. Mm. And there'll be a lot coming up so about confusing. natural treatments as well. Um, and we all want to be as natural as possible. We all want to eat fresh food. We want to look after ourselves. Um, so what is the most natural treatment for the menopause? Well, I would compare it to is rectifying the problem, which is replacing your deficiency. Yeah. Similarly, as if you had a low thyroid, I don't think anyone would bat an eye if, if someone came to me and they, they had a blood test and showed it low thyroid and I offered thyroxine. Yeah. It's, it's obvious, it's logic. Yeah. Um, well, it's the same principle yes. as, as in the menopause or perimenopause. Mm. When the hormones are beginning to go down, we um, simply propose to replace that with 
hormone replacement therapy. Mm. That's what it stands for, is just giving you back your hormones to a normal level, not a high level, normal female level. And actually it shouldn't really be called replacement, I don't think, because we often start HRT during the perimenopause, when I've already mm. said hormones start to dip. Mm. Sometimes they can only dip at some times in the cycle. So some people with yeah. PMS, premenstrual syndrome, mm. find that their symptoms are worse just before their periods, yeah. and that's when estrogen classically drops. So we can sometimes give them HRT, a bit of hormone, but we're not replacing what's there, we're just topping it up, aren't we? Yes. So it should be yes. a sort of hormone top-up treatment as opposed yes. to hormone replacement. Because that sounds quite harsh. That sounds like we're stripping women of their normal yes, hormones does, and actually. then giving them yes. something, yes. which actually happens with a contraceptive pill, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So with a contraceptive pill, which most of us have been on at some time of our life, is, is quite high doses of hormones. They're mm. all synthetic, so they're very man-made sort of processed hormones. Mm. Mm. And, and because they're high doses, they suppress normal hormone activity, don't they? Yeah. And that's why they work as that's a contraception. That's why they work to stop you ovulating. Um, yeah. So, but HRT is different, isn't it? Yeah, and that's, I think, because everyone bundles hormones mm. together. And, and, and hormone replacement is topping up your hormones. So you're at a steady level, really, a yes. female, the female level. Um, and not super high, like the pill has to be much yeah, higher, 10 yeah. times at least the dose, yes. um, to suppress um, uh, ovulation and, and releasing of eggs, but it's the whole point of it, it's good you yeah. know, for, for, for that point. But it's a completely different um, concept really, yeah. um, and it's, it's topping up hormones or replacing hormones that have been lost. And we, and we always think in the most natural way, using the regulated body identical yeah. HRT. Um, um, it's derived from the yam root vegetables, a nice derivation source. You know, it's really but you can't natural. eat yams, can you? To get but you can't yams. eat enough yams to get the right levels. No, no absolutely. Um, no. So yes, and and it's very safe, but it's regulated. So we know exactly what this it is. This is the key, is, the key. yeah. Um, the, it's very important that the type of HRT you have, it should be regulated, body identical, yes. is the best and the safest and the less side effects yeah. with that. And it means it's exactly the same chemical structure as the estrogen and progesterone our, our ovaries produce. Um, so the body likes it because it itself, if you like, it's not alien or foreign. It works much better as well because it latches onto the receptor perfectly mm. um, and then induces a, the, the function in that cell that it's attached to. Um, and it penetrates the blood brain barrier very well to help our symptoms in the brain of anxiety, depression, concentration problems, word finding difficulties, libido, that sort of thing. So that's why we all prefer this regulated body identical. And uh, that's different from unregulated bio-identical, isn't it? Yes, and that is available in some private clinics. Um, usually it's very expensive, so if anyone's paying a lot of money for their mm. actual HRT, then it's just check what the source is. And if it is a compounded bio-identical hormone, then you should really question it because it's not regulated. There's no evidence to support the, the use of these hormones. Um, so the hormones, um, our little display here, mm. um, are all hormones that we commonly prescribe in the clinic. So the oestrogen we give through the skin and some of you might have read the reason that we do that is because it goes straight into the bloodstream. We're just using the skin as a vehicle to get into the blood. Now it's different to a moisturiser for example. When we put scented moisturisers on they're made in a different way so they can't penetrate through the skin. Mm. Um, this is made so it does penetrate through the skin, goes into our bloodstream. So it's very different than if you're taking a tablet. Because if you have a tablet of something, you have to digest it and then metabolize it. So it gets broken down into something different and your liver um, has got chemicals and, and enzymes, if you like, that breaks it down. It doesn't have to do that when it's through the skin, does it? It just goes no. straight into the bloodstream. Exactly. And the reason it's important that you know that is that the liver produces what's called our clotting factors. So if we have a cut, obviously we want to clot and, and stop the uh, us bleeding, which is very good. But if you have a tablet of oestrogen, these clotting factors can become activated and there's a small risk of clot. Now, I'm not saying that everyone on tablet oestrogen should stop taking it. The risk is still small, isn't yes, it? It's, it's a small. double risk, which sounds really high, but a woman's risk of clot is quite low. So doubling a low risk is still a low risk. 
Um, but because we've got alternatives that have no risk, isn't it better to have that? Yes, exactly. Why, so, why even worry about it? No. Is, is often. Um, so we have choices, which is great. Um, so we have the gel, we have patches, or we have a spray. So for some of you that haven't seen, um, this is a placebo, but this is what the gel looks like. Obviously, this is UK, so in other countries it might be slightly different. But the gel... It's just a clear gel like this, so it's you can see it's very light, it's very easy to apply. Now it's licensed for the outside of the arms and the inside of the thighs. There's actually not much difference between the outside of my arm and the inside of my arm, and so I, I wouldn't worry too much. And you just literally rub it on like you would rub on a moisturiser and, you know, put it down. Some people, um, if they need two or three pumps, will actually put two pumps in their arms and then rub it down together. Some people put two pumps on um, one arm. It all depends on skin type. And you might see that this has rubbed in fairly quickly into my skin. Once it's rubbed in completely, like a moisturiser, and the skin is dry, then you can carry on with your daily activities. Just wash your hands, obviously, so then you're not touching anyone with oestrogen. Um, after about an hour, you can put on sunblock. If you're going out in the sun, you can go in the shower, you can go swimming, because it's already gone into your system. You can't take it out again once it's there. It only lasts the time that you use it. Um, so the half-life of it is about 18 hours. So it will only last today, um, if I'm using it today. Tomorrow it will have gone, so it doesn't build up in your system. But it's a very efficient way to get in. Some people find that it doesn't rub very well, don't they? Some people mm. say it just drips off them. Mm. If you have that skin type, then you shouldn't be using it because it means that it's not being absorbed. Um, so we then would look at something else. There is a different type of... Um, gel that we sometimes use which is in a, a sachet like this and it's more concentrated so there's less volume which can be quite good content yes, for that's some people cool. yeah. so it's quite nice having an option um, and then there is a, a spray that's um, been out in Europe for a while but more recently in the UK and um, this is only red here because it's a placebo the real one is white um, and this can be sprayed on the forearm and if you just literally spray it, you won't even see on the camera, it's a very fine mist that comes out. And then you can just rub over the excess and then it goes under the skin and it's a sort of slow release into the body. Now this is designed that you can do three sprays on one arm. Um, it, it's difficult to know roughly compared to the gel how much it is, but one spray is similar to one or maybe one and a half pumps of the gel. It all depends how the body absorbs it. But you can see if you were needing to use, say, um, three pumps of gel twice a day, you're going to run out of skin because the way you um, rub it in. Whereas this, you can quickly do it and then you're good to go. As soon as it's gone and your skin's dry, then you can carry on with everything else. Um, and then there's the patches, aren't there? Mm, so yes. do you want to just show, these are the sort of main patches that we use just because they stick on well, really. Yes, there's, there's several types, aren't there? Yeah. And um, I think some people have a problem with one, but they change the type and they're fine. Yes. So sometimes it, you do have to sort of see which one suits you, but they're very, very nice to use. Um, they come in a pack like this. I'll open the pack. Um, and the beauty of these is that they... Um, release the hormone th through the day um, just gently every hour they release the hormone so the, the hormone so it's a nice steady absorption and there we are I can see that 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 patch it's very small it's discreet it's opaque really um, and you put the, that patch on below the waist the upper thigh or the buttock under underneath the pants so no one can see if, you, if you're sunbathing or swimming or anything you can wear these swimming um you can go shower, you know just do your normal activities yes. um and and that's and that's fine um and they stay on you change them twice a week so one patch will stay on for three days and another patch will stay on for four days but they've got enough to last for four days anyway um and the hormones released slowly um every hour and is absorbed into the skin and it's exactly the same hormone as all the other yes. gels we just and sprays yeah. it's called 17 beta estradiol body identical um, 
estrogen. Um, so it's just a different way of giving mm. it. And some people uh, prefer patches to the gel or uh, they might not get on with the patches so they use the gel and vice versa. Um, but generally they stick on very well now. Yeah, um, they do. And some and people find if, if you shouldn't be having to put a sticking plaster on top. No, Some no. people on social media say to me, oh, I'm putting a plaster on top and it's sliding. Well, then you're not going to absorb the estrogen properly. No. So you should use a different manufacturer because they all use different adhesives. That's so right. So sometimes if you have a trouble with one that mm. keeps slipping off, you can find one that's more sticky and it stays on nicely. Yes. Um, but then some people have a reaction to to the glue, very rarely, but uh, yeah, it might so get a bit red or is, inflamed. It depends. If sometimes people take it off and there's some slight redness of the skin, well, you always put a new patch in a slightly different area and it calms yeah. down. But if you have a very angry, irritative area on the skin, then um, you, you probably absorb. should talk about mm. changing the type because it's just usually not a reaction to the hormone but a reaction to the to, glue. To the glue, yeah, yeah, exactly. And these are very good for people with migraines. Often we use that yes, don't we, as a first line. it's a very constant level yeah. that people get. And mm. if they come in different doses, so we can start off with a smaller dose and then gradually increase if need be. Um, they can be cut as well. If someone's mm. feeling that they're on too much, maybe initially, and their body's getting used to it, they can be cut as well. It's off licence, but it's quite safe to do yes. that as well. Yes, um, So that's, that's the oestrogen. Now, um, oestrogen is needed by all women if they're perimenopausal or menopausal. Some people will write about oestrogen dominance and say, well, I don't need oestrogen. Um, what happens in the perimenopause is you get these big swings. Don't you? Mm. So sometimes the oestrogen will be very high and other times it will be very low. And then when we're menopausal, it's always low. Um, when people um, have these swings, it can cause all sorts of symptoms. Yeah. But sometimes actually having a bit of hormone oestrogen like this um, flattens out these, these yes, spikes yes, as well. So exactly. it doesn't mean you can't have it. Um, mm. But oestrogen is the good bit. Like Rebecca said, it mm. helps all these cells that mm. respond to oestrogen. People need different doses. So it's not like the, the amount that I use will be different to the amount that Rebecca uses, that other people use, because we are all different. So we often start off with one dose and then we monitor how symptoms are, mm. don't we? And yeah. then yeah. we sometimes do a blood test to see how much is being absorbed as well. But younger women are designed to have more hormones than older women. Mm. So if a woman is in her 20s or 30s, she'll probably need a lot more oestrogen than a woman in her 60s That's or 70s. Right. Right. Um, and some people will have to wear two patches because they haven't got a, we haven't got one that's high enough strength. Or some people have a patch and then sometimes have symptoms and then they might use the gel on those that's days right. when symptoms change. So there's, and, and some people find that they're absolutely fine maybe mm. for a few months or sometimes a few years and then yes. they come back and say, oh, the HRT is not working. That's right. And it is working, but it's just that's not working right. enough. I mean, I say to, to ladies in the clinic that actually it's chasing a moving target yes. when you're perimenopausal yeah, totally. because your ovary is working but not 100% and you may come to see me and it's sort of 80% yes. f functioning um, and, I, and as Louise was saying we top up to make it the right level and you carry on but then that ovary is only going to deteriorate sadly mm -hmm. and that's natural that's normal it's going to decline in its function so as the ovary declines we need to top up more so that's why it's really important that women know about their symptoms and if their flushes or sweats mm -hmm. or their sleep uh, which had been good deteriorates again they can think aha I think I need some more oestrogen yeah. to top that up yeah. um, and it's this fluctuating because literally if you draw a graph the oestrogen goes up and down up and down in the perimenopause it's a chaotic and that's really how women can feel one yeah, minute they're okay too. next minute they're on mm. their knees and it's really important just to say a little bit about the the mental yeah. and psycho psychological changes of, of the mm. menopause because that's what brings women to their knees mm. um, the low mood um, the loss of joy I would describe it as really a lot of women have this loss of joy in in things that they used mm. to find exciting interesting their joie de vivre Everything is is an effort, overwhelming and an effort, mm. isn't it? And the mm. anxiety, and and this is to do with the fluctuating hormones in our brain. Yes. So if we can add in oestrogen, and they're fluctuating, we we find that the um, levels just steady out, yes. and that's very good for our brains and our sleep and our mood. Yeah, definitely. So oestrogen is the really good bit, mm. and 
actually it's really safe. So if we get the dose right, it can improve the symptoms that are related to oestrogen deficiency, which is great. But also we know from really good studies that oestrogen reduces the risk of all these diseases that we've spoken about. So it reduces the risk of heart disease by about 50%. It reduces the risk of death from heart disease by about 70%. So that's a lot. But it also lowers um, risk of osteoporosis, of type 2 diabetes, um, and also dementia too. We also know that it can um, help with weight. So actually, oestrogen through the skin can help reduce weight because um, our bodies put on weight during the menopause often because fat cells contain a very weak oestrogen. And our body needs oestrogen, as we've said. And how can it create it? We can't create it in other ways. We can't restart our ovaries. So fat cells produce this very weak oestrogen, which is a bit pathetic, really, mm, but it's all it's got. Um, so when you're giving yourself oestrogen, um, the fat cells don't need to work in the same way, so people do tend to lose a bit of weight as well, mm, don't mm, they? Mm. Um, so, but people are worried about HRT, and they're worried about the breast cancer risk, which we'll talk about in a minute. But everyone thinks that it's the oestrogen that mm. causes breast cancer, doesn't mm. it? And that's yes. not true, is it? No, it's not, not oestrogen at all. In fact, women who've had a hysterectomy, they have their hormones back just with oestrogen. Um, and they have been followed up for 18 years, and they have actually found to be have a slightly lower risk of breast cancer for women who are on oestrogen only HRT. Now we think, well, why isn't everyone on oestrogen only HRT? Yeah. If you do have a womb, then you have to have a progesterone. It's advised to have a progesterone because oestrogen would cause thickening of the lining of the womb. Um, and if it was left and left, it's a risk factor for further problems of hyperplasia and even endometrial cancer. So it's important to obviously to prevent that and progesterone will prevent that. So if you have a womb, you must take oestrogen for your symptoms and progesterone to protect the lining of the womb. Mm. And that's really important to know. So most um, women and also most healthcare professionals mm. who have done some surveys which have confirmed it, think that oestrogen is the bad bit of um, HRT because if a woman has breast cancer, it, it's always categorised, is it oestrogen receptor, positive or negative? Just because it's got an oestrogen receptor on it doesn't mean the oestrogen has caused the breast cancer. The same way that Rebecca said we have oestrogen receptors on cells in our body. This is another cell, but it doesn't mean oestrogen's caused it. And it's very reassuring from this study that shows over 18 years, women have a 25% lower risk of mm. breast cancer and also a lower risk of death from breast cancer mm. if they have oestrogen on its own. So really, there's very few reasons why women wouldn't have oestrogen. The biggest reason really why women wouldn't have it in their first line is if they've had an oestrogen receptor positive cancer, often breast cancer. Um, and But we haven't got good data to say that it's actually harmful for these women, but those women should be seen by a specialist menopause um, doctor or nurse um, to discuss through their options. That you can never say never to anyone about anything, and this includes women who've had breast cancer. Whether it's oestrogen receptor positive, they still sometimes can have um, oestrogen, but it, that's a very individualised yeah. choice, so we can't really talk about specifics. Um, so then, where, where does this breast cancer risk come from? Because we've said how safe oestrogen is. Mm. So we think it's the progesterone, possibly, that increases the risk of breast cancer. But when you look at all types oh, yeah. of HRT, and we're talking about the old-fashioned HRT they used to make from mare's urine, um, and looking at all the different types of progesterones, there may be a small increased risk, but it's very small. Yeah. Um, four extra cases per thousand women after five years of taking combined HRT. And what does that mean? So it's a funny thing to sort of visualize. That actually is less than drinking two units of alcohol every night. So that's a large glass of wine, isn't and that's it? A risk, and that's the really, risk. That's the risk factor for breast cancer, mm. isn't it? Drinking yeah. two glasses of wine a night yes. is the same risk as the older types of progesterone yeah. a and bit these more, progesterones, actually. yes. Yeah. Um, but if you look at a bottle of wine, it doesn't say risk of breast cancer, no. you know, stop straight away. But actually, if you look at the insert, even for the oestrogen, um, it will say in here, risk of breast cancer. Now, it doesn't have a risk of breast cancer, and even in the progesterones and the progesterone, it will say risk. 
But actually, the risk is so low mm. that it doesn't even need to be reported. We haven't got a really good study that shows that there is definitely a risk with breast cancer because um, the way the big study that was designed that came out in 2002, it wasn't looking at breast cancer as an endpoint. It was looking at um, are there health benefits of taking HRT in women who started when they're a bit older in their 60s and they gave very high doses of tablet oestrogen, um, which I've already said has a clot risk, and an older type of progestogen, which also has a clot risk actually, and a risk of heart disease, um, and possibly this risk of breast cancer, but it was so small, they couldn't say for sure, and they don't think it was statistically significant. Um, but the media were told the results before they had been analysed properly. Mm. And it went crazy in America, came over here and everyone just said, my goodness me, it's going to cause so much breast cancer, we need to stop HRT. Mm. Now that was 18 years ago in 2002, but actually the incidence of breast cancer hasn't reduced, it's increased, hasn't it, mm, since yes. that time. So if HRT, which lots of women were taking far more frequently than they do now, if breast cancer had been caused by HRT, it would make sense that the level, that the incidence of breast cancer would have fallen off a cliff and reduced, it and it hasn't. No. And that's partly because of lifestyle factors such as obesity, drinking alcohol, not exercising, are mm. risk factors for breast cancer. And breast cancer is actually more common in women who have gone through the menopause. And what is it about women who have gone through the menopause? Let's think, well, they don't have oestrogen in their bodies. No. So why are they getting breast cancer? Well, because oestrogen isn't the cause of breast cancer. So you need to take a step back and think logically. And we've all been whipped into this frenzy, haven't we, about Absolute breast cancer? Frenzy, yeah. And we're the same. We've grown up being told this wrong information as healthcare professionals. As women, we've been fed wrong information. So the work that we're trying to do from the clinic um, and some of the education we're doing is really difficult because we're trying to make people think very differently. But actually what we're trying to do is give people the evidence, you know, and the, the evidence is very clear. Okay. So the oestrogen is what's needed. We've already said so progesterone is this natural progesterone that people can take as a tablet. And in the UK, it's this, which is called Eutrogestan. Um, and it comes as a capsule. So it's an oral capsule um, that is very sort of soft. It's a gel-filled, um, jelly-filled capsule. Um, and this is the same as Rebecca said, this body identical progesterone. So it's the same structure as we produce ourselves. Um, and it can be taken in two different ways. So if a woman's starting HRT who hasn't had a period for around a year, she can take one of these every night. Mm -hmm. We say take it at night because it can be a natural sedative, which is quite nice oh, for some women actually. Um, you just take it at night, um, orally, one every night, and going forwards periods shouldn't occur. If a woman is still having periods, so she's perimenopausal, we change the way it's taken so people usually take two of these at night for two weeks and then have a two week break but continue with the oestrogen every day and that often leads to periods and some women who have heavy periods find their periods much lighter when the hormones are balanced it's yes. great yes yeah. so this is the best type of hrt um, the, or the, the progesterone to have because there's less side effects because it's a natural body identical progesterone and um, it can be good for blood pressure so anyone who has blood pressure can have the oestrogen through the skin and this yeah. whereas they wouldn't have the contraceptive pill with them no, for example so, um, and also it, it doesn't affect the risk of heart disease or clots so, so this is the safe one some people use the marina coil as Rebecca said which contains a synthetic progestogen but um, it helps to keep the lining of the womb thin and also works as a contraceptive so that can be very useful as well um, there are a couple of patches we've got here um, this one's called Everall Conti and Everall Sequi and these contain a combination of oestrogen and a synthetic progestogen that go through the skin. This is the only way that you can have progestogen through the skin um, that in a regulated way. And some people find these are useful. They contain quite a low dose of oestrogen. So sometimes people use the gel or a different patch on t as, as well at the same time. Um, but there are progesterone creams available, mm. but they're not regulated, are they? No, no. Um, so you can buy them on the internet sometimes, can't you? But 
Well, we don't know anything about them. No. I, I, you know, I would really worry about that because yeah. how much is getting into the bloodstream? After all, the reason we're taking progesterone is to protect the womb. And there's been no yes. studies that these no creams have that shown they have. that That's they right. mm. um, So, And some of these bioidentical clinics mm. we mentioned do do uh, creams of progesterone, and so you really shouldn't be taking them to protect the lining of the womb. Yeah. Um, so... So that's so it's quite straightforward. The estrogen, the progesterone, and then some people um, use testosterone as well because testosterone is another hormone that we produce in higher volumes actually than estrogen before the menopause. It's another hormone from our ovaries, and a lot of people think, well, estrogen's for women, testosterone's for men, and it's so many not. things. <laughs> people think that it's mm. so vital for women. It is, isn't it? And it, uh, we produce more testosterone yes. than estrogen, so. and it affects lots of cells, probably yep. all our cells. Um, but it, it, we know we work out of all the guidelines here. We've got very good guidelines, mm. and we work with from the evidence. But the guidelines say that if a woman has reduced sexual desire, mm-hmm. she can consider testosterone once she's on HRT. Yeah. So for those of you that are scrambling after testosterone, you have to have estrogen first for a yes. good three months, really. Yeah. Because if you don't, the testosterone just gets converted to estrogen. And doesn't work, does it? Exactly. So you have the estrogen first. And then if you still have symptoms, but it's not just libido, is it? No, it really helps so many other factors. Again, in the brain, um, Mm. so vital. Mm. Our cognitive function, you know, problems with word finding difficulties, multitasking, it can really help that. Our memory, just thinking clearer and sharper. So getting back to work is easier, um, functioning at work and uh, that that sort of thing. So our memory, concentration and fatigue is a really Mm. big big symptom and it really can help that sort of that as well yeah so it really um, helps improve stamina but also some of yes. the muscle and joint pains yes it does a, a, as well and athletes often notice straight away yes. that they're without their hormones they're much weaker mm. and even when estrogen is replaced properly they're still not back to their usual uh, standard but yeah. then add in some testosterone and their muscle function becomes much better really and stamina yeah it. so really um, and you, we sometimes do a blood test but blood tests are usually low, aren't they, in testosterone mm. levels. If a woman is perimenopausal or menopausal, it's very likely because testosterone declines with age. Whether mm. it's really related to the menopause or just getting older, we don't really know. Um, but then what we do is replace the t- missing testosterone and mm. monitor blood tests to make sure it's within the normal female range. And yeah. we don't have a licensed preparation for testosterone in the UK, which is absolutely outrageous. Shocking. It's awful. Um, Obviously there's male testosterone because of course men need their testosterone if they have a deficiency. So you can, through the NHS, um, have male testosterone in very low doses prescribed. Or some of you might have seen this, which is um, called Androfem, which is a female testosterone cream made in Western Australia. And actually, it's just been um, licensed in Australia, testosterone for women, which is a great move for women. And hopefully it will be licensed in the UK before too long. And this is just um, a cream that um, you just use. It's um, just a pea size of white cream that you rub onto to your leg. And it comes with a syringe, actually, so you can draw up the, the exact amount and rub it on. It can take several months to have an effect, so we often say to use it for six months and then yes. decide whether it helps or not. And a lot of people find it really helps with a lot of symptoms. And there's some evidence that it reduces risk of um, cardiovascular disease and maybe dementia as well so there's benefits for it too um, and then the other selection of things we have here is is actually vaginal um, symptom uh, uh, treatment so you know we've talked about vaginal dryness actually it's now been changed and uh, the term is now called genital urinary syndrome of the menopause gsm because it's quite a mouthful because of the urinary symptoms that occur, mm. a lot of people um, are, are ignored. Maybe if they're not sexually active, a doctor might not think about talking to them or asking if they've had any symptoms. But if a woman has recurrent urine infections or going to the toilet more frequently, yeah. then we really need to think about what's going on locally. And this is regardless of HRT or not. So around a fifth of women, 20% of women taking HRT, will still develop some vaginal yes, dryness. 
No, need, we, that's right. Often need treatment for the vagina in a local yes. way, as well as their what we call systemic HRT, yes. which is is the the gels and the progesterone. That's and right. Protein. And women who don't take HRT, studies have shown about eighty percent. So eight out of ten women will have some symptoms at some time and symptoms such as the flushes, sweats can improve with time, it can take several years for some people, but they often do subside, whereas vaginal dryness symptoms will carry on, often worsen, won't they? Yeah. So yeah. if you are experiencing symptoms now, then you're, you're likely to always have them unless you have treatment and the most obvious way of um, treating is by replacing the oestrogen locally in those tissues but we know only about 8% of women have symptoms, so there's a lot of women out there really struggling. So these are treatments that can be given um, locally. We've got a choice, which is great. We've got pessaries, a vaginal tablet, we've got cream, um, mm -hmm. and um, most of them just contain oestrogen, but it's a very low dose, isn't mm, it? Very low dose, and very safe to use. I was just gonna show this one as a popular one, Vagifem. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's body identical 17 beta estradiol and that's given um, the little uh, applicator with a small white tablet of, of estrogen in the in the top and it's simply inserted into the vagina um, every night for two weeks and then um, we reduce the dose according to the symptoms really you can then reduce the dose to twice a week um, but some women we find need more than mm. twice a week um, and so we we may say go up to four times a week. Um, the dose of Vagifem, this is what it's called, is 10 micrograms in, in these little tablets. They used to make um, Vagifem 25 micrograms, so we used to be able to get two and a half times the dose, but they don't make it anymore. And that was useful for women whose symptoms hadn't settled just using uh, the 10 micrograms twice a week. So you can go higher than that. And the reason you can go higher as well is because hardly anything gets into the bloodstream. So I think if you use a pessary twice a week for a whole year, that is the equivalent in blood level terms of one HRT tablet of oestrogen. So you can see it's very safe, it works really well locally in the vagina, on the walls, to incre increase blood flow, to increase the uh, layer of lubrication, which we should all have in the vagina, to strengthen the pelvic floor uh, muscles, to help the bladder muscles, so that uh, urgency and frequency help is, is helped by oestrogen, to help the lining of the urethra, the, the tube that uh, urine comes down because that can get very dry and red and angry without oestrogen and if we put the oestrogen into the vagina because the bladder sits just in front of the vagina it gets absorbed into the bladder as well so it can really help what we call those local symptoms of vaginal pain soreness you don't have to be sexually active to have these symptoms just even sitting down mm. can be can be horrendously uncomfortable women stop wearing jeans yes. or underwear yeah. it's so uncomfortable so it's a very simple, very safe way of delivering oestrogen into the vagina. And, and these are not HRT actually. No. So although it's a hormone, um, it isn't the same as HRT. So despite what the insert says, which again is out of date and, and wrong, all women really can use vaginal oestrogen. So even women who've had an oestrogen receptor positive breast cancer can safely use vaginal oestrogen because the amount that's absorbed is the same as a placebo, as in it isn't absorbed into the rest of the body. So women who have been stripped of their oestrogen because of their treatment can still safely have oestrogen locally. And that's very important actually. A lot of women don't realise that. A lot of healthcare professionals, so oncologists, breast cancer specialists, don't realise how safe it is, and it really is. Mm -hmm. So most experts are in agreement that you can, and so there's, there's really very few women who can't. And so if you've been refused it, you should really be saying what, what's the reason. So just we, for the last few minutes I really wanted to just maybe help empower you with information. It's all very well for us as menopause specialists to sit here and say this is what you need mm. but I completely understand how hard it is for so many women to um, get HRT actually. We know a lot of women are incorrectly prescribed antidepressants, some women are told it's just a natural process, you've just got to go through it mm. um, and other women are told mm. well it really don't worry you don't need HRT because it's going to give you breast cancer. Well I hope you've realised now how 
safe HRT is, um, it's not just about HRT, we have to look after ourselves as well, but HRT really makes a difference because it's that hormone. So there's lots of information um, on my website, menopausedoctor.co.uk. Um, Rebecca's got some booklets and, and, yes. and fact sheets that we have printed here in the clinic, um, but they're very easy under the resources section. We've got a lot of these that you can download, print off, um, and also there's lots of videos as well that you can show. Um, and then for some of you might have seen um, my book that I uh, came that came out last year. It's a Haynes menopause manual um, which is full of evidence-based information. I've got another book by Penguin coming out in 2021 um, and then also there's our app called Balance which is a free app available to anyone to download worldwide. Just go to the App Store or Google Play and search Balance. Um, and this has got a lot of information in it, but there's also a community section where you can share your experiences with others and others can comment. You can also uh, have the questionnaire of your symptoms and you can track how your symptoms hopefully improve with treatment and you can see how other people's treatment has um, hopefully helped them or not helped them as well. Um, and there are some experiments that you can join in with to try and maybe help improve your lifestyle. And we've got a lot more plans for the app going forward. So there's a whole armour really of ways that you can really help. Um, but I understand it can still be difficult when your doctor, who's very qualified and knowledgeable, sits there and says, no, you can't have HRT. You know, we shouldn't be here in a private clinic. We should be working in the NHS, but neither of us can get a job in the NHS because menopause care isn't a priority. Um, it will do and it will change. If your doctor or healthcare professional is refusing to give you HRT, then I think you should really just say, look, I've read this information, I know it's backed by evidence, and please, could I see someone else in the practice? Or could you really tell me the reason why I'm being denied it? And if they say it's a breast cancer risk, you can explain that you know the risk is very low, and it's about your choice. As individual patients, we are allowed to have our own choice, whether there are risks or benefits, whichever way they are, even if the risks outweigh the benefits, we can choose. But we know that for the majority of women, the benefits of taking HRT outweigh any risks. So we are at liberty to ask, aren't we, for treatment? Mm -hmm. And I know that's really hard to say, but for those of you who are waiting for treatment or those of you who are denied treatment and you think it's wrong, then you really need to have some confidence to go back to your doctor and to challenge, which I know is really difficult. But I hope this last hour has given you some information, some food for thought, some um, ammunition as well, but more importantly, some encouragement that there is help. All of us should receive the right help, care, advice, support and treatment because the menopause needs to be a really positive experience for us. So I hope this some way will help you. So thanks ever so much for listening today and um, good luck with everything is all we can say really. So thank you. Thank you.